Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to those of you who've dropped in for just this talk, and welcome back to those of you who've just been upstairs for the first talk. Um, for those of you who are new, my name's Sarah Day. I'm the science communicator here at the Geological Society. Um, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you here to our contribution to this evening's Burlington House Courtyard Lates. And you may or may not have seen a little fly with what's going on around the courtyard, so feel free to drop in and out during the evening. Um, the second, or for some of you, the first talk of this evening is The Colour of Fossils, um, and it's presented by Ma Maria McNamara, who is a paleobiologist who works on the preservation of soft tissues in fossil animals. And her recent research focuses on the preservation of colour in fossil insects and vertebrates, but also in fossil preservation more broadly, including the skeletal taphonomy of fossils and the environmental and biological controls on preservation. Um, she's currently a senior lecturer in geology at the School of Biological Earth and Environmental Sciences at University College Cork, Ireland. Um, so we're thrilled that you came all the way here to talk to us this evening. Thank you so much. Um, please join me in welcoming Maria McNamara. <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. It's great to see such a big crowd here tonight. Now, I want to start off, before I talk about colour, by just talking a little bit about fossils. Because fossils mean different things to different people. For some people, fossils conjure up drawers of tiny little bones gathering dust and fuddy-duddy scientists spending their days painstakingly describing their anatomy and describing new species. For other people, fossils bring to mind more sensationalist images, like the gaping maw of T. rex um, and other mega-sized creatures that roamed the planet during the world of the dinosaurs. These views of paleontology are, strictly speaking, both partially accurate. You also have a lot of people, when, when I say, for instance, that I'm a paleontologist, the initial reaction is, more often than not, oh, like Ross from Friends. <laughs> but paleontology is an awful lot more than these um, stereotypes. But, you know, the bulk of the fossil record consists of shells, bones, and teeth, because these are the hard, biomineralized parts of animal skeletons that resist decay. And the real-life nature of paleontology means that new species are important, so yes, it is important to go through those museum drawers and identify those species so that we can better reconstruct the diversity of life on our planet millions of years ago. And yes, some areas of paleontology are a lot more media-friendly than others. Dinosaurs attract more attention in the popular media and in books, and some would contend in high-ranking journals, than the other aspects of our science. And so, by and large, there's no escaping the fact that the fossil record is imperfect. It is grossly incomplete. So it's not a complete encyclopedia of documenting all of the different species that have ever lived. Most organisms, so I'm using the word organisms to encompass plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, and other weird things, which we don't know where they fit in the tree of life. But the bulk of animals just simply aren't fossilized. They don't make it into the fossil record. And so instead of the fossil record, you know, instead of having a search image, an image like a, you know, encyclopedia, Instead, when we think of the fossil record, we should be thinking of something like this, a, a tattered, battered history of life with whole chapters missing, pages turned back to front, upside down, and so on. So the bulk of the fossil record consists just of the hard parts of animals. And this means that when we use the Shelley fossil record to reconstruct ancient communities, we're only seeing a tiny fraction of the life that actually existed. And to illustrate this point, take a look at this. This is a standard reconstruction of the seafloor, so shallow marine realm, during the Middle Cambrian. So we're talking in the region of, you know, 510, 520 million years ago. And if you were looking at what's preserved just by virtue of the Shelley fossil record, you might be looking at some animals such as this. You might be looking at things such as some trilobites, some little archaeocyathids, funny coral-like creatures, a few little brachiopods, and maybe some weird little shelly creatures called hyaliths. And that's typical of the shelly fossil record about 510, 520 million years ago. 
But we only really get a sense of how incomplete this record is when we come across fossil biotas in which the decay-prone soft parts of animals are preserved. So this is, I'm talking about things like skin, like integument, like arthropod cuticle. When these decay-prone tissues are preserved, then our picture of what ancient communities looked like is vastly different. So this is the picture we get of the Middle Cambrian sea floor when we look at, when we use evidence from exceptional biotas. So fossil deposits in which soft parts don't rot away, in which they are preserved. And so these, these types of fossil deposits, these exceptional biotas, or conservat lagerschatten, as they're also known, these are actually critical archives of the history of life on Earth. They give us unique glimpses into the diversity of ancient ecosystems. They fill in the blanks. They show us what animals were living there that lacked hard parts. So they're actually really important in understanding the history of life on our planet. And why am I banging on about this? Well, everything I'm going to show you tonight is based on these types of fossil deposits. Because when we're interested in studying the color of ancient animals, we need to find evidence of those softer tissues, the skin, the hair, the feathers, the arthropod cuticles. So why should we be interested in fossil color? Isn't this just a, you know, a, a peripheral field of paleontology? Well, in recent years, the paleontological community has come to realize that the soft tissues of animals can preserve evidence of original color. And we're talking about diverse ta types of taxa, diverse species. So animals from different parts of the tree of life can preserve evidence of color. And this has led to a really quite dramatic explosion of a new field of research in paleontology. But what is all this fuss about? Well, to answer this question, all we have to do is look outside. You know, when we look at the animals and plants that we see in the world around us, we see striking colors, striking color patterns. Color is a really key evolutionary adaptation of modern animals. It usually characterizes integumentary tissues, so tissues that are derived from the integument. So skin, hair, feathers, in arthropod cuticle. But, but um, color pigments also occur in some of our internal organs. And color is best recognized for its key, for the for the key roles it plays in visual signaling, in communication. Animals use color to communicate with each other. They use color for camouflage, for um, avoiding predators, for um, mating signals, and also for signaling within their, um, within their social group. So evidence of color in animals therefore has the potential to tell us about this very enigmatic <coughs> aspect of the biology of ancient organisms. Evidence of color usually isn't preserved. Color tells us about behavior. Evidence of behavior usually isn't fossilized. But color is a way in to understand animal behavior. What were they actually saying to each other? How, you know, what messages were they sending to each other? And more than that, Modern animals, certain types of color, actually have roles in maintaining the internal environment. They have roles in physiology, in homeostasis, in maintaining a constant internal environment by protecting against UV damage, protecting against damage from free radicals and other things, toxins that can damage our tissues. So color in fossils may not only tell us about their behavior, but also about their physiology. And fossils are really, evidence of fossil color can actually tell us how these elements of biology have evolved through deep time. Because fossils give us a temporal context for understanding patterns of evolutionary change. They give us a time, we can pinpoint changes to specific times. So we can reconstruct changes in the evolution of behavior and physiology over millions of years. 
Now, it's worth mentioning at this point that animals actually generate colour in two very different ways. Most of us are familiar with pigments. These are chemicals. And they're certain types of chemicals that are really good at absorbing light of specific wavelengths. And so other wavelengths are reflected. So the common, most common pigments that we come across in the animal kingdom are things such as the melanins. These confer the colour that we are most used to in our hair and in our skin. Your freckles contain an awful lot of melanin. Um, they also occur in fungi and bacteria. Carotenoids, these are really common pigments in birds and plants, but birds cannot synthesize them. They can only obtain them from their diet. And then you have other classes of pigments, which I'm not really going to spend any time on. Terrans, porphyrins, flavonoids, luciferins. These are what make glowworms glow in the dark. So these are, that's produced by a pigment. That effect is actually a pigment. Now, structural colours, these are something really quite different. These don't involve pigments at all. And how these are produced is actually by an entirely physical process where light is scattered by tissue structures that are ordered precisely on the nanometer scale. We're talking about biological crystals inside animal tissues. And the tissues are ordered so precisely that they're really good at scattering very specific wavelengths of light to produce what are really the most purest and intense colours in the animal kingdom. And so these are some examples of structural colours that we um, may or may not be familiar with. That sheen that you see on the petals of tulips and other flowers, that is a structural colour phenomenon. Um, the beautiful bright green and blue colours of some butterflies, those are structural. Um, the wonderful bright colours of many birds, these are structural colours. And I'm going to um, touch on these as well as pigments in my talk today. So the problem is, you know, we can talk about coloured fossils all we like and we can talk about the importance of colour. But the fact of the matter is most fossils don't preserve any evidence of colour, any visible evidence of colour, may I add. So most fossils, even fossils which preserve these valuable soft tissues, all they look like is just, you know, various shades of black, maybe some tonal hints, different shades of brown, but that's it. You know, fossils, even with soft tissues, are preserved as brown to black tones. And to muddy the waters, many fossils preserve colour that isn't biological at all. That's just an artefact produced during the fossilisation process. So the wonderful colours you see here in these fossils, these are not the colours the animals had in life. These just reflect the presence of different minerals or mineral ions. So certain types of metals, things like calcium, iron, zinc, titanium, that are present in sediments and that get sucked up into soft tissues during, fossil, during fossilization. The tissues basically you know, absorb them like a sponge. And these cause different tones like you see here. They tell us nothing about the colour of the original animals. So as paleontologists, we have to exert a degree of caution when we're studying or trying to study fossil colour because we cannot assume that things like this actually tell us anything about biology. So what types of fossils do preserve evidence of colour? Well, fossils such as these. So we have evidence of colour preserved in diverse um, uh, groups of animals, um, mostly insects. Here you see some examples here and feathers, but we now have evidence of colour in other fossil tissues that I'm going to mention shortly. I very briefly want to just discuss how do we study fossil colour? Well, you can study fossil colour in different ways. You can get down to the real nuts and bolts basic geology. You go out in the field with your hammer or your JCB, whichever you're allowed to use. JCB, you can take a lot more rock than just with the hammer. Well, you can take it quicker, it takes longer if you've just got hammer and chisel. You go out into the field, you look for rocks that haven't been buried very deep. If, if rocks are buried very deep, if they're heated to excessive temperatures, well then, basically, the organic remains of the soft tissues get boiled off. They get converted to coal, oil, or gas. So you want fossils, you want rocks that haven't been buried very far. 
Um, then you might bring them back to the lab, chat about what you found with your colleagues, pop them under the microscope, and ultimately, unfortunately, what we're talking about in terms of studying fossil colour is hacking at these fossils with a knife. Now, I use the word hack, really, we're talking about high precision remove dissection <laughs> of sub-millimetre samples through the microscope, and you know, you're trying to pick up tiny pieces of soft tissue that are far smaller than a millimetre, so that you don't disturb the overall integrity of the fossil. And you put them into fancy machines like this that can tell you about the tiny details of their structure, their anatomy, and also, if you're lucky, you might be able to extract details of their chemistry, what they're composed of. And so using these kinds of techniques, we can identify evidence of colour and we can start to think about what's this evidence telling us about behaviour and physiology. So a typical fossil that preserves colour might look something like this. So this is an example of a structurally coloured fossil beetle. It's a jewel beetle. So beetles like this exist today in the tropics. They're really rather common. They're so common that they're used as earrings. If you walk down the streets of um, Borneo or Indonesia, Thailand, you'll be able to buy earrings made up of, you know, clusters of the modern relatives of these beetles. And they are just as brightly coloured. So this beetle is 49 million years old, and this colour has survived. In this fossil deposit, the rocks haven't been buried particularly deep. And so you can preserve the specific features, the structures in their cuticle that are making the colour. So what do these structures actually look like? How do we know what to look for in these coloured fossils? Well, as any paleontologist will tell you, if you want to understand the past, you have to know about the present. So most paleontologists, if they study a fossil group, they will also study the modern relatives that are around today. <clears throat> so I've spent a lot of time studying modern beetles to try and be, to be able to interpret the evidence of colour that we see in the fossils. And these are the types of anatomical structures that can produce these brilliant metallic colours and also rainbow effects. So these are three different types of photonic nanostructures. They, they interfere with photons of light. They scatter photons of light. And based on the distance between the ridges or between the layers here or between the corners of the lattice here, those distances actually control the wavelength of light that's reflected. The thicker the layers or the thicker the gaps here and here, then you'll scatter long wavelengths. The structure will produce orange and red colours. But if those structures are more closely spaced, then you'll scatter shorter wavelength colours, blues and greens. And so these are called diffraction gratings. An everyday example would be the colours you see on the back of a CD. Do you remember CDs? Some of you, yeah? So the, those wonderful rainbow colours, those are actually produced by a diffraction grating on the back of the CD. Um, here, this, this is called a multi-layer reflector. These all have fabulous names, these nanostructures. And an, an everyday example of a multi-layer reflector is the colour you see in a soap bubble. You know when you blow bubbles and you see those wonderful swirls of pinks and greens and blues? Those are thin film reflectors, just like this structure here. And these, these are three-dimensional photonic nanostructures. These are actually the most complex structures that are produced by biological um, creatures. They're the most complex biological structures known. Um, and these are by three-dimensional biological crystals, and they are absolutely wonderful. And these produce really pure, really bright colours. And an everyday example of one of these, well, it's not really everyday, but um, have some of you may have seen opal. And you may have seen that wonderful, it kind of, when you hold a piece of opal in the light, um, you'll see sparkles of colours ranging from blues to greens and reds. So 
these are all, you all have seen some types of photonic nanostructures. So you can bring that home today. Um, and so when my colleagues and I studied these wonderful colored fossil beetles, we wondered, are these colors false colors, like I mentioned earlier, or are they these photonic nanostructures? So we took some samples of these. Here's some examples of these colored beetles. They have various colors, yellows, blues, greens, reds. We took small samples, like I showed you, with the knife, and we put them under some very powerful microscopes, the um, electron microscopes. And here's the outer part of the cuticle, and this scale bar here, this is five microns. Now, to put that into context, the width of a single human hair is 100 microns. So these things are really tiny. They're so, you know, they're, they're nanometer scale. We're talking about thousandths of a millimeter. And when we look at this region up here at the top, in a little bit more detail, with an even more high-powered electron microscope, we can see layers. And these layers are identical to the layers that we see in modern insects with these metallic colors. So it looked like a multi-layer reflector. But to prove it, we had to do some modeling and show that these, these structures are capable of producing visible wavelengths. When we did the modeling, we got a positive result. So these are fossilized photonic structures. So these fossil insects were crawling around millions of years ago with these highly complex structures in their wing cases, in their legs, producing the exact same types of color that insects use today. And what these colors are actually used for, in modern insects, they are, these multi-layer reflectors are used almost exclusively for sexual signaling, for mating displays. So they're actually really important because a lot of what we do as paleontologists, we try and understand what drives evolution. Is it natural selection, survival of the fittest, or is it sexual selection? So, you know, uh, pressure that's exerted by our mates. Here's a really good example of how, you know, these organisms are going to great kind of energetic kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, it takes an awful lot of metabolic energy to produce these structures, an awful lot of effort. If you can produce them to form these colors, you are showing that you are a good mate. You know, you can afford to expend tons of energy producing these complex structures and yet, you know, make a living, as it were. So good evidence that, you know, um, and uh, I, ha I hate to say it, but it's actually, there's, a, there's evidence that an awful lot of these um, multi-layer reflectors are involved in um, uh, female mate choice. Because in lots of insect taxa, they are coupled with things like UV reflectance, and only the males have the UV reflecting colors. The females like the males that produce these colors and that where they also reflect in UV, um, for instance. So there's a little bit about uh, fossil beetles. We also found some other types of insects. Here's some examples of some butterflies. So we found about 30 of these fossil butterflies that have this wonderful yellow color. And when we looked in detail at the structure of their scales, we found highly complex ridges and grooves and pores on the surface. And when you look at these in cross-section, again, they're forming layers. So the reason why these fossil moths are brightly colored is because they also contain a modified version of these multi-layer reflectors. The modern relatives of these moths also have these same bright colors, also have the same structure in their scales, and they are poisonous. So there's, there's um, some evidence to suggest that the modern relatives are using these bright colors for predator avoidance. If the predator is silly enough to actually take a nibble, well, they're going to get a nasty shock. They're going to get a mouthful of alkaloids, real bitter taste. So there is no evidence of these alkaloids preserved in the fossils. They're not particularly decay resistant. Um, but there's a suggestion that this evolutionary strategy actually originated a very long time ago. And it's been a successful strategy for this family of insects. 
even though we can't pin down at which point in their lineage they actually start incorporating toxins. Um, now, just to put a little bit of a downer on all this, um, one of the questions we asked ourselves, and a very important question, is are these colours we see preserved original? Or have these colours been altered by the fossilisation process? So what myself and some colleagues did, we got the bright idea. Well, let's take some modern beetles with these structures and fossilise them. Or, to be more precise, um, we simulated parts of the fossilisation process. We basically took these beetles and squashed them um, <laughs> and cooked them in a really fancy piece of apparatus that involved, you know, a steel door that was, you know, almost half a metre thick and a blowout wall in case the whole thing exploded because we were running these experiments at really high pressures to simulate what happens when you go down, when you go deep into the Earth's crust. And when we did these experiments behind this, watching through, watching via um, the safety of a little interlink uh, camera um, and analysed the results, we saw that the colours of our beetles changed. As pressure and temperature increase, so as you simulate burial of animals into the Earth's crust, which is something that happens all fossils, the colours become blue shifted. They change from greens through to turquoise, blue, and eventually you heat them up so much, and you squash them so much, that the colour disappears. They just turn black. And we also analysed the chemistry, and we found that, OK, as well as the structure changing, those layers get thinner, the chemistry also changes. So we've got a double whammy here. Not only is the actual structure changing, so you know, you're going to be reflecting shorter wavelengths, um, also the chemistry is changing. That changes, that affects the way light is bent as it passes through them. So that will also affect the wavelength. So the bottom line is, those wonderful colours we see in these fossil beetles and butterflies, they're not original. Um, we have to, you know, do a little bit of backtracking to try and predict what the original colours were. And the amount of kind of a retrograde work you have to do actually depends on how deep they're buried. When they're buried really deep, it's actually really difficult to assess how much have they changed. If they're only buried slightly, you know, within 100 metres, they haven't been heated up very much, so we don't see much colour change. Right, so, fossil pigments. So, most of the work that has been done over the last nine years on fossil colour has actually been done on pigments and not structural colours. But before then, let's say before 2008, you know, there were paleontologists working on fossil colour. So, for instance, um, for many years, uh, paleontologists, paleoclimatologists, people who like to reconstruct ancient climates, have been using evidence of carotenoids derived from algae, such as these, to actually, so they've been using evidence of carotenoids preserved in sediments to infer how climate has changed through time. Different species of algae produce different types of pigment. It's as simple as that. Different algae like different climatic conditions. Um, there's also evidence of pigments preserved in some body fossils, like these fossil sponges. In some fossil leaves, you can still preserve evidence of chlorophyll. And there's some weird boron-based pigments preserved in some of these fossil um, echinoderms that have no known analogue. So, you know, there are some people who have been working on, on evidence of pigments in sediments and in body fossils um, uh, before this more recent explosion in fossil colour work. But the bulk of research over the last nine years or so in fossil pigments has focused on melanin. Now, melanin is the stuff that colours our hair and our skin, also feathers. And melanin is... so it's the most common pigment, the most widespread pigment in animals today. And here are examples of granules of fossil melanin preserved in a feather that is 125 million years old. So those of you in the audience who have or had black or dark brown hair, your melanin granules look like this. You've got sausages in your hair. 
But those of you who are blessed with foxy, auburn, ginger hair, well then your melanin granules look like this. And the same goes for feathers. Black and brown feathers have sausages, reddish feathers have little spheres. And so a few years ago, some of my colleagues at the University of Bristol got the bright idea of using this to try and infer the color of fossil feathers. In particular, not just any old feathers, but feathers in dinosaurs. And they didn't just pick any old dinosaur that had very obvious feathers. They picked the first dinosaur that had ever been reported to have evidence of feathers, Cynoceropteryx. Now, you're saying to yourself, where are the feathers? Is this lady gone mad? Well, Cynoceropteryx is a really controversial feathered dinosaur because the feathers are about this long. They are literally hair-like structures that are about a centimetre long. And so when these were first reported, um, these caused absolute pandemonium in the paleontological community. Number one, here's direct evidence of a link between dinosaurs and birds. Number two, these hair-like structures, could they be feathers? Do birds have, do any birds, modern birds, have hair-like feathers? The answer is yes. Turkeys, they have a few hair-like bristles under their chin, a couple of other types of birds. But, the, you know, it's fair to say that a lot of paleontologists weren't convinced. So my colleagues in Bristol were really very clever. They actually killed two birds with one stone. They, <laughs> they used this fossil to demonstrate that, number one, these structures were feathers, and number two, what color they were. So they took Cynoceropteryx here, and they took a sample of these feathers, a very tiny sample, because it's a holotype, highly valuable. That it's insured at 1.5 million um, pounds. I know because I tried to bring it to the UK and got stopped at the last minute by the Chinese Minister for Agriculture, who's also responsible for fossils. He was too busy to sign the paperwork. We had the transit all sorted with BA. We were making a big, big deal out of this, but the minister was too busy to sign the permission. So he never actually made it to London. But um, we managed to get samples. And we took samples from here. And when you analyze these under the electron microscope, you see little spheres. Now, these were really significant because there were some paleontologists who claimed that the hair-like structures were not some kind of primitive feather or protofeather, but they were actually just strands of collagen from the skin. Nothing to do with feathers and feather evolution and nothing to do with bird-dinosaur links. But collagen doesn't have melanin granules. You find these, you know you've got to be dealing with some type of appendage that's growing out of the skin. So there's your evidence that these are not dermal strands, collagen strands. They are primitive feathers. And because of the shape, if you... Have we any redheads in the audience? You have one back there? Yeah, perhaps. Well, if you remember what colors are produced by these little spheres, very specific, ginger. So this was the first side, this was the first color reconstruction of a dinosaur based on actual robust scientific evidence. And this banding, this the pale tones here was because it simply just lacked feathers in the ventral part of the body. And this banding here, well, if you look at the tail of the fossil under a microscope, you see regions, you see bands where you find these little hair-like feathers and bands where you don't. When you look at modern feathers, um, reddish feathers have spheres, black feathers have sausages, white feathers have, don't have any melanin. They have no melanin granules. So the areas where melanin was absent can be reasonably interpreted as pale-colored regions. So, and this is really neat because this color reconstruction can actually tell us a bit about the behavior of this creature. In modern animals that have striped coloration, we can, the, the stripes are used for one of two things. Where the stripes are on the body, on the torso, they're disguising the most important part of the body, the vital organs. They're breaking up the outline of the body. We call this disruptive coloration. Where you have stripes on something as frivolous 
and non-essential as a tail, it's typically used for signaling. So a lot of birds, zebra finch, for instance, have a wonderfully, really striking banding on their tail feathers. And they can afford to do it because the tail isn't critical. You can afford to have a really bright signal on your tail. And if a predator is attracted to that, they pull out a chunk of feathers and that's that. You know, it's slightly different when your feathers are really short, but there's evidence here. There's a suggestion that this coloration, you know, there's no clear camouflage function here. Instead, the best explanation for this color is some kind of mating display. So there you go. First dinosaur with feathers was using color for signaling. So long before feathers were used for flight, they were actually used by animals to communicate with each other. And since this study came out, well, melanin granules have been reported in diverse other fossils. So they've been reported in various other feathered dinosaurs, fossil birds. They've also been reported in the ink sac of fossil squid. Ink, modern ink, um, modern squid ink contains melanin that looks just like this. They've been reported in the eye spots of fossils. Our eyes, all vertebrates and some invertebrates, contain melanin in their eyes. Um, it's used as a screening pigment to protect against UV damage. And melanin has melanosomes, these melanin granules have been reported from fossil um, uh, skin. But there are some paleontologists out there who don't believe this. They think that this is merely coincidental and that all of these spheres and sausages are not melanin granules, but in fact are the remains of the bacteria that were decaying the carcasses of these animals as they were rotting. And, you know, we can admit that there is a very strong morphological resemblance between these melanosomes and these decay bacteria. So over the last few years, there's been an increasing evidence, uh, emphasis towards looking for chemical evidence um, in support of this fossil melanin. So here's a very nice study by some of my colleagues at the University of Manchester. They took this fossil bird, Confucius Ornus. You can see the white regions here. These are the bones. These are the wings here and here. There's the head up there. And you can see all this black stuff. These are the feathers. But what was really interesting, when they mapped the spatial distribution of metals across this specimen, they got a really interesting result. They found here, the, the green here is zinc. Zinc is rich in the sediment. The blue is calcium, which is rich in our bones. And the red, these are showing areas that are excuse me, that are rich in copper. Now, copper um, likes to bind to melanin. Copper is one of these metals that melanin likes to suck up or ad adsorb. And what's really neat is, if you look here, here you can see there's copper in the feathers around the neck. We can follow them down the shoulders, but we kind of lose it down in the wings. But when you look at the actual fossil, you can see the feathers continue all the way down here. This is telling us that these parts of the wings didn't contain melanin, that they were pale colored. And so here's an example of reconstructing color of a fossil based on um, chemical evidence. And you know, people have since used some more sophisticated chemical methods to look for fragments of the melanin molecule itself. So these black dots here, 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 and here, these are key fragments of, mo of um, the melanin molecule. They're preserved in the fossil, and we can even use some even more sophisticated methods that actually identify intact breakdown products of melanin using a nasty peroxide oxidation process. And these have been reported from fossil squid. And myself and my research group in Cork, we've been looking for, we've been using this technique because it provides the most diagnostic evidence of melanin in fossils. We're finding it in lots of different fossil groups. And so all of this chemical data and these little granules, these have been used to produce some really wonderful color reconstructions of uh, various fossils. Um, you know, uh, birds, feathered dinosaurs, and even marine reptiles. And 
what's really neat is there's some people who've actually tried to think a little bit more broadly of what about, about what all of this melanin is actually telling us. And so uh, some colleagues in the US, they did a study looking at the shape of these melanin granules. And they found that modern mammals in their fur, their melanin granules have really diverse shapes. So here we're looking at length versus width in all of these little plots. So the mammals are in blue. The green here, this is showing us the diversity of the range of shapes of these melanin granules that we get in reptiles, modern and fossil reptiles. You can see it's very narrow. Um, the same is in dinosaurs. And, but when we look at fossil and modern birds in yellow and orange, and here in red, we can actually see their melanosomes have the same range of shapes that we see in modern mammals. So what's going on here? Well, these researchers, they noted that the, the way our bodies produce melanin, we have a really complex process that happens in our cells for producing melanin. And it's actually intimately linked with our physiology, in particular with our metabolism and our growth rates. And so what we can see here is that reptiles and dinosaurs that didn't have feathers, they have a very narrow range of shapes of melanin granules. But here, when they start producing feathers, um, and in mammal hair, the range of shapes increases. So this has been used as evidence as a major transition in how the melanocortin system operates. This physiological system for making melanin. And so there's evidence, right? What's common about modern mammals and modern birds? They're warm-blooded, right? And these modern reptiles are cold-blooded. So this has been used as evidence for a fundamental shift in the physiology of dinosaurs from a cold-blooded state to a warm-blooded state that happened at the same time as they were producing melanin and evolving feathers. So actually, when dinosaurs evolved feathers, it's almost, it's very likely that this completely altered their metabolism. You know, it changed their physiology from being cold to warm-blooded. Um, now, quick point I want to mention here is that there were a number of studies published some years ago which actually started looking in more detail at the shape of these melanin granules in fossil birds and feathered dinosaurs. Because in modern birds, the precise dimensions of those little granules actually controls the color. So depending on whether you're, you know, gray or beige or brown or russet or black, your melanosomes will have different shapes. And they vary in very precise ways in modern birds. So Initially, it appears that we might be able to use precise shapes in fossils to infer very, you know, specific tones in fossils and produce, you know, very precise reconstructions of color patterning. Um, the problem was we hadn't really considered how the fossilization process might change the shapes of these little granules. So together with some colleagues, um, we sampled feathers for a whole range of modern birds that the feathers have different colors, but they all contain melanin. And we squashed these using the same technique I mentioned earlier. We put them in little foil packets or little sealed gold cells. We wrapped them up and we put them, this is our fossilization kit. Um, this is the danger tube. You don't want to be anywhere near this if this blows. When we first started using this, it was located in the basement of our building. And that was all fine. It was very convenient. If I wanted to do an experiment, all I had to do was pop downstairs. But then one of the members of staff uh, did some calculations and worked out that if there was a pressure leak, if any one of these valves blew, well, then that pressure cylinder would be ejected up through two floors of the building and about 300 meters into the air, such as the pressures we were using. We were running these at, you know, between 500 bars to kilobars of pressure. 
And so when the university figured that out, they put it in a concrete bunker 20 kilometres away from main campus. <laughs> so it really gave you the feeling that you were being looked after. You know, you can still do your experiments, but just do them far away from us. <laughs> so when we did these experiments, um, there's, you know, there's our... There's the kit, our steel door is here. There's a very dangerous, you don't want to go in there when we have the experiment running. And we found that all of our lovely diagnostic feather structures, they just, they're just destroyed by the heat and pressure. But the little mel melanin granules survive, which is great, but they change shape. They contract on average by about 20%. And that's fine. Maybe you could just apply a 20% correction to the fossils. But it's not that easy because there's a huge amount of variability in this. You know, depending on which species we were looking at, they might contract by 30% or 10%. So we can't use precise geometries to infer precise colors in fossils. But what we can do is we can use broad shapes. So in our experiments, the sausages, you can't turn a sausage into a ball and vice versa the sausages still look like sausages after the experiment. So you can still infer whether the colors you're looking at are the black and brown tones or the russet style tones. Now, I'm aware that we're, time is ticking on, so I'm just very briefly going to mention other pigments. Because you might be forgiven to think that all that we paleontologists working on color do is just look blindly at melanin. And, you know, we're kind of, you could forgive us for doing this, because melanin is really robust. Right? It's really hard. You throw acid, alkali on melanin, even weak peroxide, and it won't dissolve. It just stands the test of chemical attack. It stands the test of time. But we wondered, is it possible for some other colors to be preserved? Because these colors we see in the world around us, only some of them are melanin. If we were to only, if we were to find these creatures in the fossil record, based on their melanin content, we would be reconstructing colors like this. And that didn't work. There we go. So that's what we would be in reconstructing the colors as, because all that we see preserved, all that we've been looking for is melanin. But actually, we wondered, are those other pigments that give the real color, the real vibrancy to life, are those other pigments fossilized? So. We looked at a fossil snake, a bit of an odd choice, you might think, but it's one of the fossils that I had worked on years ago as my PhD. And I had remembered that this fossil snake had very nice scales preserved on its surface. So we went and we took our knife and we cut little samples of this fossil and we looked at what was inside. Now, I'm just very going to show you, this is what skin looks like in a modern snake. You have a really thin epidermis, you have all these pigment glands here that look yellow and black, and then you have loads of collagen underneath. And that's what they all look like in a bit of detail. There's our collagen, a cross-ply network, looks like plywood, and different types of pigment cell. When we looked at the fossil snake, this is what we saw. We've actually got the entire structure of the skin preserved. The epidermis up here is a little bit cruddy, but we don't really care about that because all the pigment cells are down here in the dermis. Here, all of these tubey looking things, this is our plywood-like structure of collagen in the dermis. Now, we're interested in what was going on up here. And when we look at this in more detail, we could see preserved in three dimensions all of the different types of pigment cells that we see in modern reptiles. There's different types, um, iridophores, xanthophores, and melanophores. What am I on about? Well, this is what they look like in a bit more detail. Iridophores, these are little flattened cells. They contain platelets that reflect light, produce spectral colors, like an iridescence effect. Um, these structures here. These are xanthophores. These contain carotenoids, produce red and yellow colors. And these big structures up here, these are melanophores that contain melanin, these little granules of melanin. So we were able to basically do a really comprehensive study of modern snakes and work out what different combinations of pigment cells make different colors. When we applied it to the fossils, well, we took samples from different parts of the body, from the belly, from the back, and from the sides. 
and we, we found that, right, we have different combinations of these different pigment cells. What colours do they represent? Well, easy. We had done the comparative analysis on the, on the modern snakes, so we could produce this colour reconstruction. And so this has come up again. Apologies. This is what our snake would have looked like. Now, we don't know if it was striped or if it had spots or if it had blotches, but based on comparison with modern snakes, we can say that it had a pale belly, that its back and sides were relatively dark. This is, this is countershading. This is a really effective way of camouflaging yourself. And that along its sides and back, the colours changed from greens to yellows and blacks and browns. So this animal was using colour to break up the outline of its body in some way, just like the modern relatives, which have colours like these. And this fossil was really nice because it confirmed that the fossil record can preserve all of these other types of pigments, and so we can reconstruct animals in their true colours, not just based on the melanin, which is more commonly preserved. Now, I'm going to just very quickly just skip through. We are working on pigmentary colours in insects. We're working on these 3D photonic structures. And I just want to finish off to leave some time for questions. The, the key take-home messages, which I'd really like you to remember from this talk, is that we can infer the colour of various types of fossils. In many cases, we're doing this using evidence for melanin, the exact same stuff that we have in our hair and skin. And this melanin, not only does it tell us about colour, but it tells us about behaviour. It can actually tell us about evolution, big evolutionary changes, like those changes that we saw in the physiology of dinosaurs. We can also preserve things that other than melanin. We can preserve structural colours in fossils, and we can preserve other pigments. So we can reconstruct colours you know, using the full colour spectrum. And we have ongoing research in my group where we're looking at pigmentary colours in insects and some of these 3D photonic structures because we're interested in how did these really complex structures evolve? What were the drivers in terms of habitat and behaviour. So with that, I just want to put it up there. You know, my group are a bunch of really <coughs> nice guys. They're really hard working, do lots of cool work on fossils. And I should thank the people who pay for all of this. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know I went on for longer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria. For that. that was absolutely fascinating. I've got so many questions. And um, we are a little bit tight for time. I think you're about to do this all over again yeah, it's in fine. about seven minutes. Yeah, so, um, we, should we maybe time. have one? If anyone's got a burning, quite quick question, um, <laughs> feel free to raise your hand now. I'm happy to answer questions until you Cool, stop. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. you might want to chat in the, in the gap between the two lectures, if not. Or if you've got other places to rush to, feel free to do that. Um, yep, question at the back. Question at the back. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, with that, I think we'll have to um, call it a day there. And thank you so much for a fabulous talk. If you <laughs>. We're, we're about to move into the entrance hall for a, a talk from Alice, Alison Siskovich about uh, the colour of maps. So um, if you have 15 minutes more to spend with us, feel free to come through.